Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tako Dibitz, director of the collections of the Rijksmuseum. Welcome on this beautiful day. I'm amazed that so many of you are willing to sit, not even in front of the night watch, but in the Rijksmuseum in an auditorium. Um, but it's for a very exciting subject, and a subject that has um, created quite a stir over the past years, especially since, and I think the Rijksmuseum, we can actually claim that we were one of the first, or the first national museum to make a rigorous decision um, in this field, since the Rijksmuseum decided to give its images for free on the internet, um, without limitations and the highest resolution possible. And indeed, everywhere I come, for every um, introduction, every speech, I see that people use the images of the museum. So it is a great help in dispersing our images. And images are what we are as museums. Images, images and images. The power of the image, which is particularly nice if you think about computers, because computers, the net, telephones, tablets, they are mainly about images. And it's the perfect way to reach an audience worldwide, to penetrate in every sitting room, at every breakfast table, even at every, in every bed, because most people appear to read their tablets in bed, um, whenever you want, um, with the images of the museum. You can see them in the museum. Nothing goes above the authentic object. But on the internet, you can touch them, you can look at them whenever, wherever. And I think that this, for the Netherlands, is very important, as we are a small country, and we sometimes tend to see Dutch painting, Dutch art as Dutch heritage. But I think it's important for us to realize that it is not ours, it's not Dutch heritage. Dutch art is world heritage and has an interest from all over the world and inspires people from all over the world. And Nelly Kroes, our European Commissioner for the Digital Agenda, said in a conference not too long ago, what we share defines what our culture is. And I would like to make it even simpler and say, what we share is what we are. So we should start to share as much as possible of the treasures that we house in the public domain, and they belong to everybody, as world heritage belongs to all of us. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Paul Keller. I'm uh, Vice Chair of Kennisland, and um, I'm here to introduce the two speakers we have tonight. The first speaker is James Boyle, sitting over there. Um, we had a joke at the conference where he's coming from that he needs no introduction. I'm going to give a short introduction. Um, and afterwards, we have Mayan Hamasma from the Ministry of Culture. Um, and we're going to have the two presentations, and then we're going to take questions afterwards. And after we've taken all the questions, we can have some more drinks in the restaurant or in the cafe of the museum, which is on the other side. So James Boyle is here for, um, James Boyle is one of the founders of Creative Commons. He's director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain at Duke Law School. And he is one of the most authoritative and maybe funny voices about the public domain. Those of you who've had the pleasure of listening to him this afternoon know what a treat we're probably in for. And please take the stage, James. We're happy to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mariska. Thank you, Taco, for that a very nice introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here. This is, um, was one of my favorite museums, but I haven't been back since the renovation. So this is a personal, um, enormous uh, pleasure. And it's also a subject about which I'm very passionate. Um, I'm not an archivist. Um, but what I do is basically go around the world telling cultural heritage institutions that the people who work there are heroes. Um, and that they have to work harder. Um, but the, I, I'm going to focus a lot on the first uh, part of the message um, and only leave the, the Scottish sting in the tail uh, till later. So um, the title of the talk um, was a hugely long one, Cultural Heritage Institutions as Guardians of the Public Domain in the Digital Age. Um, the 
more realistic title might be, We Need to Think About Posterity Again. Um, that title is drawn from a song um, by the band King Crimson, a notoriously dissonant and progressive band who were extremely obscure, who wrote a very beautiful um, song, a ballad, called The Night Watch. And I'm going to begin with it, um, impossible violation of copyright law. Uh, shine, shine, the light of good works shine. The watch before the city gates, depicted in their prime. That golden light, all grimy now. Three hundred years have passed, the worthy captain and his squad of troopers, standing fast. The artist knew their faces well, the husbands of his lady friends, his creditors and counselors, in armor bright, the merchant men, official moments of the guild in poses keen from bygone days, the city fathers frozen there upon the canvas, dark with age, the smell of paint, a flask of wine, and turn those faces all to me, the blunderbuss and halberd, shaft and Dutch respectability. They make their entrance one by one, defenders of that way of life, the red brick home, the bourgeoisie, guitar lessons for the wife. So many years we suffered here, our country racked with Spanish wars, but they're no longer in the World Cup. Now comes a chance to find ourselves, and quiet reigns behind our doors. We think about posterity again. And so the pride of little men, the burgers good and true, still living through the painter's hand, request you all to understand. That song is about the way that we speak to each other across the centuries. That's what this is about. It's about the way that the burgers think they send one message. The genius painter perhaps sends another in those faces. And the viewer with the patina, the thick patina of 375 years of fame, maybe understands a third. That's a conversation that goes on over centuries. And one person, one institution, allows that, that conversation to take place. You. Thank you very much for that. So my premise is this. Cultural heritage institutions have always had a role in guarding and providing access to the public domain. But that role has changed dramatically in ways that we have not fully grasped. And I say that, I mean all of us have not fully grasped. In many ways, the things that I'm talking about are things you are already doing, efforts that you're already taking. What I'm trying to describe is the point of view from which those efforts appear as a whole. So what roles do institutions of cultural heritage have? Most obviously, preservation, curation, and access. Preservation, the goal is to make sure that the heritage is not lost to the, the ravages of time, of air, of dry rot, of beetles, of sunlight, wet. But it's also a different kind of preservation. At the moments of enthusiasm for the pop star of the day, for Miley Cyrus grinding her posterior, whatever it is, cultural heritage is the quiet voice that says, in five years, this really won't seem very important. Why don't you come check out the stuff that lasts? Curation, the second role. And creation is, curation is not something that is just passive. At their best, institutions of cultural heritage guide, showcase, they put out the words and treasures of the past in a way that resonate with the issues that concern us in the present. They find the neglected gem. They look back at the prejudices of the past that perhaps stopped something being recognized for what it was worth and rediscover things, gems hidden in the archives. They help the interested searcher. And then comes access, and here I will put on my Scottish preacher mantle for a moment. Access is a noble mission, and I have one request to all of you. Please, please, archivists, librarians, museum directors, preach your principles louder. You serve one of the most noble causes there is. The basic premise to me is this. The moral warrant for access to cultural heritage is having a pulse. That's it. That's what makes you deserve your cultural heritage. Not money, not status, not education. Hi, I'm alive. 
welcome. Right? That's the basic principle. Now, sometimes we all know that premise has to compromise, be compromised. The gallery may need to charge for the glitzy Tutankhamun exhibition to fund the restoration of the photos from World War II. The rare book may need to be protected from the grubby hands of the interested. But the norm, the default, the baseline is this. If you're human, come on in. This is your culture, just as much as it is ours. A weaker form of that premise is if you are Dutch, or you're British, or European, welcome. This is Dutch heritage, British heritage, European heritage. But for obvious reasons, I prefer the more universal one. Guardianship 1.0 involved identifying, preserving, and providing physical access. The library preserved the books, made them physically available one patron at a time. And this is really important. I know you've thought a great deal about it, but it, it, it can't be emphasized too much. In practice, the library's role in granting access to an orphan work, or a public domain work, or a work that was in the collection but was no longer commercially available were pretty much the same. It was the same book. True, that book was in the public domain, that book was commercially unavailable, there we don't even know who the copyright holder is, but what you were doing is checking it out. Your role was the same for the things you had access to. The British Museum made available the cultural artifacts that we Brits had so thoughtfully liberated from their original owners. Thanks for those marbles, they're lovely. Um, and we gave them to the Mark I eyeball of the viewer who paid in time to walk around the collection and look at it, and paid in the time required to go to the British Museum. But again, access is physical and material. The book's in the library, come and read it. The painting is in the gallery, come and see it. Guardianship 2.0 is much more complex. The changes I'll focus on are legal, and the extension of copyright means, as you know, that it is much harder for you to do your jobs. Technical, for the first time really in history, we have the technology that allows meaningful one-to-many access over the World Wide Web. Rather than just queuing or checking the book out to the library, I can see it, as you said, right there on the screen. And social. People's engagement with their culture comes as a part of a culture in which people expect what Larry Lessig calls read-write access to their culture, not just read, not just the passive viewer, but the person who's used to being able to comment on, to, to tag, to include in a dialogue, perhaps to modify. This is a different kind of access than simply respectfully staring at the, uh, at the painting or reading the book. So it's ironic that I'm telling you this because <laughs> seated in the room are the people who've actually done the most, uh, engaged in the most meaningful enterprises in providing one-to-many access, whether it's Europeana, whether it's the amazing work done here at uh, the Rijksmuseum or elsewhere, the, the good folks at Canisland, all of these, these fine projects. So you know this very well, but take this as, as praise. Um, once we get into the role of one-to-many access, all kinds of things have to change. We need different kinds of capabilities, different kinds of expertise, different kinds of engagement. Most obviously, there's an incredible technical cost. We need a significant ramp up of technical capability, and frequently public institutions are expected to do this without being given the resources to do so, and that's an enormous problem. Um, one of the things that I'm gonna be talking about is the need to make more forcefully um, the, the case for funding, both public and private, so that we can actually um, adequately give access to our cultural heritage. And I'm also going to argue that actually this is worthwhile not merely because it is the right thing to do, which is a good reason, but also because it will yield all kinds of benefits which are very hard for us to, um, to imagine in the, in the, uh, right now. Second thing is that cultural heritage institutions have sometimes unwillingly, because you all had other important jobs to do, had to take on a policy role, and that role is only going to grow more important. In the old days, you preserved our heritage from beetles and dry rot. Well, now you need to preserve it from the beetles and dry rot of the law, of copyright law in particular. You need to point out that poorly thought out legal changes have wreaked more havoc on our relationship to our own cultural heritage than many of the intentionally destructive acts of the past. In one uh, 
article I wrote, which was on the anniversary of the publication of Fahrenheit 451, Ray Bradbury's science fiction story about the dystopian world in which firemen are people who burn books. Um, I say it was on the anniversary of its publication because the book was about to enter the public domain, but because of repeated copyright extensions in the United States would not do so for many years. Luckily, we have access to Ray Bradbury's book and the famous ones that are still under copyright and still commercially available. What we lost, as everyone in this room knows, are the orphans, the commercially unavailable ones, the ones where we can't identify the copyright holders because this is extraordinarily hard to do and because copyright is a strict liability system um, which imposes significant penalties. The recent Orphan Works Directive in the EU is much to be praised, but there is much more to do, certainly in the US, which has notably failed to do that, but even I think there are shortcomings, great shortcomings in our current Orphan Works structure. I suggested in that work, and I was not being hyperbolic, that the greatest piece of book burning that was being done had been done by lawyers. That what we had done is taken most of the culture of the 20th century and made it practically unavailable to those who would digitize it and make it available. When, and this is the ironic part, right at the moment in history when we had the technology to do it. In the United States, as little ago as 1976, copyright lasted for 28 years and you could renew again for another 28 at the end of that if you wanted. Some of you in the audience will know how many re uh, people actually renewed. Uh, the answer was that it was um, only 15%, uh, one five. 85% uh, of the work went immediately into the public domain after 28 years. How would those of you who work in the cultural heritage institutions like that, like a public domain that begins after 28 years? And I should add that for books it was uh, over 90. It was films and the records that, that pushed those numbers up. What we did is make those works unavailable for people to access, to read about, to use in education, to turn into large format, to produce braille versions. And we did it with no financial benefit to almost all of the authors, 96, 97% of the authors, so absolutely no financial benefit. So, just to summarize, Right at the moment the technology arrived to make our cultural heritage available, we chose A, to make it unavailable, and B, to do so for no good reason. Even had we said, okay, ask if you want a copyright term extension, we would now have maybe 2 or 3% of those works under copyright. I don't know, is it worse when something is malicious or when it's stupid? Because if it's worse when it's stupid, then this is really bad, okay? Now, I know you know about this, but I, sometimes I think well, there's a sort of Stockholm syndrome about be dealing with copyright uh, policy. You know, the, the, the terror, you, know, you say, actually, he's a nice terrorist. You know, he's, he, he only hit me once. There's a way in which we get used to this. This is so ludicrous. It is such a work of cultural vandalism, and we should be furious about it because there is no good reason for it. Unfortunately... For too long, cultural heritage institutions have been the only people who stood up and said, hi, over here, I represent the public debate, um, often drowned out by the celebrities and publisher representatives on the other side. Uh, those voices need to be louder. They need, with the greatest respect, to be more effective. Um, I would frequently read, I actually read the reports all of you produce, and there would be these fabulous statistics buried on page four in a footnote rather than leading with, if the Rijksmuseum, if the British Library wanted to clear these works and find out whether or not they could actually get permission from the copyright holders, just identify the copyright holders, it would take more hours than there are in the copyright term, right? This is quite a powerful statement. You have to start thinking about being clear and forceful because the facts and the moral Rectitude are on your side. This is a good place to be. Finally, and this is where perhaps I will meet more raised eyebrows, cultural heritage institutions need to question the sort of statist, centralized, hierarchical vision that has sometimes, uh, they've sometimes taken of their own role or been expected to take on their own role. So there's an extreme version of this towards the public domain, which I call the French public grass theory of culture. 
So I used to hitchhike around France, and um, being something of a troublemaker, I would make it a point every time I stopped at to go to the large patch of beautifully groomed grass in the center of the, the town, and I would go and sit on it. Because all of you know, in, in France, if grass is French and public and beautifully groomed, you are forbidden from sitting on it. This is public grass and thus may not be used. This is the whole point about public grass is it's too good to be used. And one, um, one policeman, one gendarme, kindly explained this to me. Um, I was pretending to have even worse French than I do. And so I, I, wide-eyed, I said, but there was no sign to say that it was forbidden. And he said, in France, everything that is not specifically permitted is forbidden. <laughs> Um, the French public grass theory of the public domain says, yes, there is a public domain of cultural heritage, and you can look at it from a distance, so long as you have the attitudes towards it, so long as you treat it in the ways that we tell you you should. But at the slightest whiff that you might actually do something with it, perhaps take the old song and make it into a modern version, the old movie, and remake it, take the book and turn it into this, uh, take the high-quality JPEG of the Night Watch and turn it into a hip-hop-themed parody, bang, we clamp down because you're clearly misusing your access to your cultural heritage. A less extreme and more benign version of the same is that the state and only the state can be trusted, one, to digitize our public domain, and two, that once digitized, access to it must be doled out with care, lest someone profit for, for it, from it, or use it to further ideas we don't like, or make silly mashups of it in a way that will rob it of its cultural power. I like the second version of these visions of the role of public heritage institutions more than the first, but I, I'm going to argue that both don't go far enough. In my work, I have talked about a bias a psychological bias, which I claim we have. And I want to be clear that it's a bias. A bias does not mean you're always wrong if you believe that. Sometimes your biases are correct. I live in the United States, and when I see the license plate, someone that says Florida, and we are driving in snow, I stay 200 feet back because I assume in a biased way that this person has absolutely no idea what to do and is going to fishtail and possibly crash into my car. It's a prejudice. It's based on some fact, but it's a prejudice. That one might be empirically based. The one I'm talking about is a different kind of bias. It's what I call cultural agoraphobia, fear of openness in access to culture. I want to give you a couple of quick cultural agoraphobia tests. These are audience tests. You can play along. Um, those of you who aren't streaming the Germany-France game. So. Um, Imagine, and for some of you, you really will need to imagine because you're very young, that it's um, around, let's say, 1994, and so I say to you, okay, um, I need a plan about how to create the best library, the best um, reference work in the world. I want something that's absolutely exhaustive. I want it in most languages. I want it updated in real time. Um, I want it to be incredibly current. I want it to deal with thousands more subjects than the Encyclopedia Britannica now does. What's your business plan? Person number one says, well, absolutely, it's very easy. What we need is very strong copyright. We need to make sure that this stuff is never copied. We need digital rights management. We need to lock this stuff up. We need salespeople who go around and basically say, if you don't buy it, your children will never go to university and there'll be failures and live at home in your garage. <laughs> We need trademarks. The Encyclopedia Boileania needs to be the number one encyclopedia in the world. And we need a rigorous, top-down, corporatist uh, model in which we have a board of directors who choose the best academics in the world, who then put their names on articles, in fact, written by their graduate students, who are then carefully peer-reviewed by editors, who in turn put their graduate students to doing that. And the end result is fact-check a million times and finally published. So that's business plan number one. And person number two, who strongly resembles Jimmy Wales, stands up and goes, um, I think we should have a website and, you know, people could put stuff up. That's business plan number two. That's it. That's the entire business plan. And, you know, edit it, check it, you know. That's it. I'm going to claim that there is no one in this audience, not a single person, 
who, as of 1996, would have said, oh yeah, plan two is great. That's totally going to work. You would have said, wow, you possibly might want to visit a few a, a few less of the hash bars in Amsterdam. You know, you really might want to cut down on those or increase your meds. Um, you would say, you're delusional. This is insane. It's ridiculous. The world doesn't work that way. You can't get an encyclopedia by basically turning it over to the world and hoping that stuff happens. A pur si move, and yet it moves. If you're wrong about that, what else are you wrong about? If I asked you to design the World Wide Web as of 1991, and I said you have two choices, one I went laid out in great detail, strongly resemble, resembles Minitel or uh, the old state-controlled systems, rigorously controlled, only a few people can get on it, you know, the BBC's on there, you know, a few other places are on there, the Rijksmuseum will be on there, it's basically a one-way, sort of slightly more teched up cable TV in which you receive passively information, and guy number two says, oh no, no, how about a system that everyone can connect and they can put everything up and they can say whatever they want and that's it. <laughs> you would say, sorry, that's insane. There will be porn, check. <laughs> there will be spam, check. There will be strangely articulate sons of Nigerian oil ministers who ask for your money, check. <laughs> there will be massive copyright infringement, check, check, check. All true, by the way, absolutely true. You nailed it, absolutely nailed it, well done. 100% on the bad things. Would, there be, would anyone ever use such a thing? Pfft, ridiculous. Make money from such a thing? Pfft, ridiculous. Buy and sell things over such a network? Oh, that, that's really crazy, right? I mean, that's crazy. Use it to provide useful information about the world. When did you last consult a reference book, by the way? Just a basic reference book. <laughs> Ridiculous. We are brilliant at understanding the dangers of open systems. Brilliant. We have 2020 downside vision. We see perfectly and accurately all of the possible dangers. And we are systematically, cognitively biased against their benefits, those we don't predict. Who would predict, I mean look, most of the stuff on the web is wrong or crazy, right? Right, is written by, you know, idiots. And if you ever want to lose all faith in humanity, just read YouTube comments. I get to about seven, and that's like, that's it, I, I give up, right? And yet, all of you use it every day to provide useful information. How can that be true? Because we figured out something, which yeah, most of it's probably wrong, but you know what? The People who use the net know what the good sites are, and they link to the good stuff, and Google follows the links, like following the animal's tracks to the waterhole. It's a lay form of peer review. We've reinvented the 16th century academic article, except we made it out of hyperlinks. And that's what the web is, and that's why it works. We got that wrong. What else have we got wrong? So, conclusion. I'm going to argue that all of us, and I particularly include myself, feel discomfort sometimes when we are pushing the boundaries, pushing the envelope of opening stuff up. We see brilliantly the dangers. We think of how we'll be tarnished or how bad things will happen or Nazis or pornographers will get hold of something or publishers will yell at us or you can fill in the rest of the list far better than I. Um, I'm going to argue that what in the long term, what we actually need in our current unbalanced copyright culture is not that we always move to the side of freedom. I was talking about a bias, not a mistake. Sometimes being closed, being in control is right. Sometimes property rights are great. But what we need is a counterbalance, a force that says, you know what, the public domain is important too. And the analogy that I've used in my work is the environment. To believe in the environment is not to be against development. It is to say the environment and development coexist in an ecosystem. You need to understand both things. Just as with the environment, we sometimes think, who speaks for future generations? Who speaks for endangered species? Who speaks for the rainforest? And we've started to create institutions that actually do, that represent those views. We need an ombudsman for the public domain. Guess what? Right now, you're elected, because right now, you're it. Sorry, but you know, you maybe didn't sign up for it, but it's the job you've got. Practically, 
We need free online access to public domain texts and images in full with as few restrictions as possible. I commend the Rijksmuseum. I can't commend enough. I think we allow commercial use. We give up the idea that money makes cultural activities ritually impure. Uh, we will not die because the Rijksmuseum goes onto a coffee, because the uh, night watch goes onto a coffee cup. Um, we give up the desire to charge for such activities. Ah, you made a profit. I'm going to recapture the profit. It's not the way it works. Um, we can learn from the history of things like open weather data, which turn out to provide vastly more benefits economically So when they're made freely available, as they are, ironically, in the United States, rather than available um, only on payment, as they often are in Europe. We need open systems for engagement. And by open systems, I mean we'll minimize the number of qualifications, whether in G, uh, geo, IP address, operating system, video, viewer text. We want the system to be as open and flexible as we can. We make the public domain usable to the extent we can. My um, Jennifer Jenkins, my colleague and also wife, wrote a fabulous article called In Dubious Battle, The Promise and Peril of Public Domain Day, which talks about all the initiatives trying to replicate the features of the public domain in the world that, where the public domain is, is threatened. And one of them, she pointed out, is looking at initiatives to mark and tag the public domain. Say, hey, this works in the public domain so that you can use it. That requires expertise, something that archivists have a great deal of, and it requires the willingness to actually take a risk and go, yeah, this is in the public domain, you can use it. Making available the public domain that was already there, but which citizens can't discover because they don't know whether they can use it or not. Dispelling the clouds of legal doubt. We need a constant churning experimentation with different kinds of ever more open engagement, read-write engagement. Don't freak out when the amateur film buff actually turns out to do a better job than your highly professional restoration department. You know, it's good, that's great, you've got another ally. Don't listen when the culture police huff and puff about the use of your images. When you realize that people are reading your books and looking your art straight from Google or Bing, don't lament the fact that they haven't gone through your carefully constructed portal with its gorgeous and carefully created search index, which almost no one uses. When the junior librarian archivist comes to you with a crazy idea that's sort of good but not very well thought out, be kind. Don't stamp on them. Encourage them. Don't let the horror of what the Nazi or the pornographer can do to the collection stop you from enabling the smart school kit or the amateur buff who loves the material. Think about having citizen archivists. The National Archives in, uh, in, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. have done this. They actually bring in people who are really keen on the records and willing to dig through. And they say, okay, we'll give you an office. We'll give you some support. You can have a blog. Like, go to it. What, what can you find? They find things in the archives, right? Think of the people as your friends. So what I'm arguing, in other, in other words, is that this wonderful, laudable priesthood, the priesthood of archivists, should minimize, lessen its power that it should allow direct engagement with the sacred texts and objects. So where would you find a priesthood willing to lessen its own power? The Netherlands? We might call this the Cultural Reformation. The Reformation, after all, was a fight about whether or not you needed a priestly intermediary between you and the sacred text. The Protestant movement, I'm not talking about the, the whether the theology of it's correct, I'm just talking about the form, took an open source approach. They said you need direct access to the operating system, to the holy code. And the people on the other side freaked out and they said, there will be heresy, check. And schism, check. And Spanish wars, check. But you know what? There was also the idea that the person who decided the citizen's relationship with the sacred text was the citizen. And that was a noble enterprise, regardless of the theological correctness or falsity of the ideas being presented. The study of law has taught me one very important thing. We don't get to decide whether or not to make mistakes. We may get to decide what mistakes to make. When we have the presumption of innocence, we say, you're innocent until proven guilty, and it's hard to prove you guilty. We're choosing to let guilty people go because we'd rather make that mistake than imprison an innocent person. We get to decide what mistakes to make, where the domain of our mistakes are. I'm asking you to make great mistakes, to make bold mistakes, 
to go out on a limb and do things that make you feel, you're not sure if this is going to work. Because in those efforts, if the cultural agoraphobia premise that I started from holds true, will also lie great successes. And in those successes, perhaps we can think about posterity again. Thank you.